You're listening to the best of the Dental Up Podcast 2018 with your host, Sean Keating. Hey everyone, this is our last episode of 2018 and we have a special one to end the year. You know, we do this podcast each week. I think this is number 140. You know, it's basically just about dentists. You know, it's their story. Uh, We don't really have anyone else on but real world dentists that are doing work in the chair every day. And we heard a little bit about their story, where they went to college and, you know, what they did to start off. If they started off as an associate or went in and started their practice straight up and a lot of great stories and just I've worked with some of these dentists for many years and I found out a lot of things that I didn't know about them and it's just such a neat thing so many people behind the scenes doing stuff to make this uh, all happen but we have so many dentists you know that I wish I could have got every one of them on this podcast it would have went for several hours but uh, it's just a snapshot of kind of some of the best of 2018 and uh, again man I thank you guys for listening every Thursday to our podcast enjoy this uh, last podcast of 2018 and uh, we'll see y'all next year you're listening to the best of the dental up podcast 2018 Hey, everyone. Uh, there, here's a little animation clip of one of the podcasts I was talking about when I was in high school and I got a couple of swats for carving my initials on the trainer's table. Just did a little animation on a, on a clip of uh, part of the podcast, but uh, I, I thought you guys might enjoy this. True story, baby. <laughs> Thanks, man. Enjoy. Uh, it's so crazy. I remember my biggest scare was after uh, elementary school, you know, we had junior high at seventh and eighth grade here, then high schools ninth through 12th. And so when you got a sixth grade, you knew that you're going to the junior high and then you had to do PE, you know, as one of your classes each day, you know, you had seven classes sure. or whatever. And uh, you have to go shower after PE, buck ass naked. And uh, <laughs> it's like, I was just the scariest thing for us back then. But after the first few times, you know, you did it. You did it all the way through high school and you know you shower the football team I remember getting in trouble where I actually had to take a toothbrush and go into that shower in high school <laughs> it was like a senior year <laughs> I forgot what I carved my initials on the training table you know SK44 is my football number and they were so oh. pissed at me so I got a couple swats and then uh, I, I got yeah that's crazy they were, they were allowed to spank you swat you no. in junior high right. in high school and then uh they made you. They made me clean the showers for like an hour for one of my periods uh, in there. You know, get in there and go clean the showers. I'll be there, and all the guys are laughing. But uh, yeah, that I hope you got some credit with your fellow football <laughs> players for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of just came out of nowhere. I kind of forgot about that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> what a life. <laughs> story. <laughs> this is the Dental Up Podcast. That's a trip. And then what about at, um, that's not UOP where you went to college. It's no, uh, no, uh, okay. UCSF, uh, okay. the, the me- real San Francisco <laughs> school. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, tell me a little bit about that journey. What was that like, uh, getting in there and then, uh, were your, your instructors cool? Did you, did, you, did, you, did you have a good, ex, you know, experience? Tell me a little bit you know, about uh, that. Uh, let, let me um, uh, segue into that there. Uh, let me give you some background information. You know, when I applied, I, I had, I thought I had really great scores. So I only applied to like five or six schools. But when I applied, um, it my application went in, I believe, in September. You know, the application process starts in June. It's an open uh, enrollment is what they call it, a okay. rolling uh, admissions process. Okay. So if you get into June and there are 100 seats available, you have a bigger chance. Your probability is better, right? Yeah. But if uh, the cycle ends in December, so at the end, um, they start giving out their admission seats, I think December 1st or something like that. So if they've already handed out and students who've already been accepted calls the school and ex- takes that acceptance seat, then now you're fighting for 12 remaining seats. So yeah. your probability goes down, right? And so um, for me, uh, I thought I had really great scores. Uh, I still do, um, but I only applied to like five or six schools. And uh, when it went through, it was in September. And I thought, you know what? Uh, I wanted this one letter from my research advisor at UCI. And uh, you know, I asked for it in September. In October, she went on maternity leave. November, she had the baby. December, she finally got it in oh. to the, the 
ad SAS program okay. that you submit your application. And so schools uh, will not look at your application file until it's entirely complete. So oh. this is an advice that I can give you know, to all your <laughs> listeners. You know, uh, if you are stuck in that situation, uh, just submit it as is and then submit your, you know, whatever remaining documents that you have, a letter of recommendation from anybody, and then just submit it to the schools individually. At least your your application file within AdSAS is closed. Yep. They can submit it to all the schools that you paid to submit it to. Yep. And then, you know, if it's going to cost you, you know, if you've applied to 10 schools, you know, cost you the, the shipping charges of to 10 different schools, hey, you're, you're it's better to be in that earlier yeah. uh, open enrollment like process. June. Yeah. And then yeah. so coming so, in at December. Yeah. So, so that's what happened. My application closed in December and, uh, you know, I did get uh, some interviews and I did uh, get waitlisted. Now, um, I didn't get pulled off that waitlist and I'm like, dang, you know, this is, this sucks. You know, I have to wait in a whole nother year, but I learned from it and my parents were like, you know, maybe, <laughs> you know, like you're too cocky. You should apply to more schools, but uh, apply to some backup schools and maybe it's your interviewing style, you know, and I told him, no, mom, dad, you know, like I love talking to people you know it, it's not that trust me and yeah. so then uh second round second go around i everything went in june 1st and if if the biggest advice that i could give to your listeners again the the, the, the second nugget is, is what i'll call it yep. is to uh you know apply early yep. uh once you're in early and my application did not change i did not change any essays i did not change a single thing i didn't take the dat's a second time uh, i submitted everything on the first day that it opened and uh, the only difference was i applied to more backup schools you know just in case mm -hmm. um when i went to these interviews i uh, i think out of the 13 schools i got uh an interview from, um, or I applied to 11. I got, uh, I got interviews to 11 schools of the 11. I went to, uh, six, uh, six interviews and I got into all of them. So, um, the funny thing is when I went on these interviews, these dental schools would say, you know, Dave, uh, you, I, we see your application from last year, you know, and we have your application from this year why do you think you didn't get in? And I told them that, you know, my theory in the open um, admissions process, the rolling admissions process. And uh, sure enough, they said, you know what, with, with your numbers, your GPA and your, your score, you should have gotten in. Yeah. And we, we don't see, we don't know why you didn't get in. And, but you know, the, the timing of it is, is really, uh, was yeah. the key factor. Absolutely. And so again, that second nugget, you know, apply early guys. Uh, Big, big key. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Oh, sorry. And then going into San Francisco, yep. my experience there was great. The, the faculty up there was so much fun. Um, learned a lot. I, I think, you know, everyone's experience in dental school is... Um, it's going to be a little bit different because it's going to depend, be dependent on which faculty are there. And, you know, the school board or whoever, the HR, whoever hires on these dentists, you know, you're never going to know who's going to be there because there's a lot of volunteer faculty. Oh, and yeah. uh, some of them will make your experience different than others. Some of them are more business minded. So they'll give you that, ex that background in, in, in that aspect. Uh, there are some that are more keen on like uh, technique or a uh, lab technique or, okay. you know, and so again, everyone's experience is going to be different. Um, um, but I think most importantly, it's the class that you come in with, yeah. which you have no control over. That's the admissions uh, process, the, the students that interview you, the faculty that interview you, right? Yep. And so luckily my class, we were all very well-rounded. And so, um, you know, we had so much fun after the first year, uh, I think spring break, we went on a, a trip to Vegas for <laughs> someone's birthday. There was like 30 of us oh. in the club or something like that, <laughs> you know? And then um, I think after our first summer uh, a group of us there's like six of us we we did a trip to hong kong and thailand oh, and we all flew from all of our different vacations uh, during that first summer but we all met up in thailand for oh. and, and we did our thing in two weeks no uh, kidding. So it was a lot of fun but everyone's experience is going to be different i say you know be open-minded to you know who you meet uh just be very open because you have to be with your peers for the next four years yeah. you, know, you don't want to burn bridges uh you know, so. As a reminder, you know, if you're a dentist and you're listening to this podcast and, you know, you don't work with my lab, that's fine. I mean, most of the dentists that are on here work with me, but I've had a couple that haven't. So if you are a dentist out there, you want to be on the podcast, give us a call or go ahead and email us over there at david at keatondentalarts.com. If you want to come on for a podcast, I'd love to have you, man. So I know yeah. you're into like um, 
intraoral photography and stuff. How'd you get into that? Tell me a little bit how, why you got involved and who was some of your maybe mentors on that? Well, in all of these big courses you take at Panky, Spear, anywhere, you know, everyone's showing off their dentistry and teaching you how to use these photos for patient presentations. And um, so I, I hired a photographer. He's local here in Denver, Bill Moore. And he uh, basically will just set you up with um, some settings, some presets where okay. you learn, um, you put it on this one for intraoral and you put on this one for portrait. But I found that if you can show the patient, it, you know, and this isn't, that little camera that's hooked up to your x-rays and you take a picture of one tooth at a time. This is more like a global view of the whole mouth. Okay. But I think if you can show somebody their whole mouth instead of one tooth at a time, they're more likely to look at it as uh, like a system that works together versus, you know, if you take a picture of one tooth with a crack, they'll fix that one. Oh, absolutely. Um, but after, you know, I started doing that with the presets for a little while, but I got more into it where we were taking some really cool portraits and I find that nothing makes your dentistry look better than being able to take a really nice picture of it. And uh, we were doing some portraits and having fun with that. And I've gotten, I've gone a little off the deep end and <laughs> learning from these like high fashion photographers. So we're having a lot of fun just dressing people up and putting them in gowns or um, suits and just, you know, I think that if you, you can become a completely different person if you've got the right smile. Oh, and that's so what the, the portraits are all about is, you know, who could you become if, if you were able to smile wholeheartedly? So we've been having fun with that. This is the Dental Up Podcast. As an educator in our field, what is the one thing young dentists should focus on when choosing like their CE path? I know you've you've done so much CE yourself, given so much CE, but some of our younger dentists, what are some of the some of the focuses what they should be looking on when when they're thinking about their CE? I think two things. Well, maybe three. Uh, but two of them are directly related. Well, they're all related. I think materials some had to have a good handle on materials the the things you're using one of the you know when i'm participating in the various parts of you know dental town or facebook or something when i ask somebody what they're using and i get an answer something like well it's in a yellow bottle <laughs> exactly and i have to tell you i'm a little frustrated with that you know especially if they're having difficulties and you know so what are you how are you using it well you know like the instructions say and and that's of course, that's not true either, but those kinds of things. I think if whatever you're using, I think it's, it's you're obligated to know what materials you're using and how you're using them. So I think materials, just from the standpoint of the, you know, this not you don't have to know about pouring stone and all that, but you need to have a handle on the kinds of materials you're using. Then you need to know how to use them. So, and then it becomes some basic operative dentistry. I mean, it, you know, because everybody's a little green coming out. So knowing good handle on operative dentistry, restorative dentistry, the materials. And then the other thing they should get into really early is occlusion. Yeah. Because that's a, that's a very, very huge part of your practice, no matter who you are. Not that you can do full reconstructions on every patient because nobody's going to be able, well, almost nobody is going to be able to do that. Yeah. But if you have a handle on what is happening, the kind of things that are happening and how occlusion relates and some fundamental grasp of the concepts behind it, then I think you're going to be much better off. Well, so I think those are the three areas that, that, don't, that won't cost you a fortune, but are well worth investing in. Okay. One of the things I wanted to say okay. was that as dentists, usually we have patients who break everything we put in their mouths. Yes. And that is one of the more exasperating aspects of dentistry. But what I want to say is that with the advent of the, the Bruxer and Bruxer set of crowns, that's come to an end. 
so the patients that I have who tend to fracture have had in the past fractured everything I've been able to give them, I am able to stop that at this point. Now, it is my opinion that no one should have a fractured crown anymore. I mean, if you, you need to make sure that there's a sufficient thickness of these crowns, and I always make sure that I have at least two millimeters clearance occlusally. Yeah. And that's that to me is really, really important. And I when I see fracturing occurring in crowns or when I hear about it, I know that it's because people have said to them, you only need one millimeter or you need whatever. And that's just not true. Yeah. If you have the one millimeter, if you go with one millimeter, then you know you'll you should have no trouble with uh, with these crowns at all. Because I know, uh, you know, we've all seen this. I don't know if everybody's seen the smash test, but that's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. You know, yeah. just hitting it with a hammer into a piece of wood. And, you know, I have not, I have not ever had a uh, Bruxer, you know, a KDZ Bruxer or Bruxer aesthetic fracture. I've just never seen that. But like I said, I do, I make sure I have two millimeters of clearance, as you know. And, and, and I think that is, if everybody would do that, then they would not have, they would not have any trouble. The, and it is nice to be able to look at patients and say, you're not going to be able to break this. Yeah. I'm putting this in. You're not going to be able to break it. And, you know, spend the, in the ones and the Bruxers, the pure, the KDZ Bruxers are a little bit less, you know, aesthetic than the Bruxer aesthetics, obviously. Yeah. They're a little lighter, a little more opaque as they are the polycrystalline oxide. And they don't have the cubic in them. But but the people who break them really don't care about that. Yeah. They just want something that looks okay and is not going to break. Yeah. I mean, that, that is their main concern is that it just not break anymore. And so, you know, we finally have something I can give them yeah. on this. And, and to me, this is one of the more valuable tools that I've had in a very long time. Hey, just a reminder, if you could uh, go over to iTunes and search Dental Up and leave us a review, man, a little five-star review, man. We'd be really appreciative with that. And, uh, you know, leave us a review, leave some comments on it, tell us what you like if you could. And, um, you know, I really would appreciate that. Again, thanks again for listening to the Dental Up podcast. What concerns do you have about the future of dentistry? I think that most dentists have to be concerned about what, dental insurance companies are doing to the dental profession. Most people, when they get a job, they get dental insurance with that job. And because of that, the employers who pay for the insurance premiums are trying to limit their dollars in what they spend in both medical and dental. And the way I see it, this might be wrong, because their medical costs have gone up in recent years, they are trying to decrease their overall medical costs. And where do they cut? They cut in dental. So where in the past they might have offered a choice of an HMO and a PPO, and maybe the, uh, the person who was making the choice had a little more removed from their paycheck to pay for the PPO, a lot of them now are only getting a PPO as the only option. I'm sorry, an HMO as the only option. And I think that hurts dentistry a lot because most people, and you can't blame them, don't know the difference. To them, it's three different letters and they have no idea. And they expect all dental offices are the same. And if you're in the profession of dentistry, I just don't see how an HMO office can deliver you the same care as an, any type of office that's able to give you the options. And as you know from earlier in our conversation, I did HMO dentistry and while I did it, I followed all the rules and I gave every patient the same quality crown or filling that I did my regular patients. But after a while, yeah. you just, you realize it's tough to deal in only that type of situation. And my other concern is when you're getting out of dental school or you're just starting that you almost have to go into a large group practice. And here in California, we might be ahead of the what's considered the norm in the rest of the country, but we have a lot of huge 30, 40 chair practices oh, no. where it's the only place you can get a job. And they're dealing in HMO dentistry. And I know from personal stories, and I won't tell them, but I, I've worked with other dentists who told me that they just do things that are unethical because they're maxing out whatever they can to uh, create the dollars that are needed to run that type of a practice. And my concern is in that train of thought that if you're a young dentist, you just went to dental school, you learned what considered ideal dentistry is, 
but you haven't yet learned what practical dentistry is. And um, you're going to get some bad examples set in front of you in that type of an environment. So if you can learn what you can, as Sean mentioned earlier, take what you can out of that type of a situation, I think that's great. But for a career, I just don't see anybody lasting that long. It'll mentally drain you or you'll just become basically a bad dentist. If you're out there and you're able to been doing that for 10 years, you know, God bless you. But I, I just don't see how you can do that. This is the Dental Up Podcast. That was the most rewarding case of, of my career. Um, she's actually my dental assistant down there and she's just, she only works 16 hours a week and, okay. uh, and uh, she, her teeth were in terrible shape. And uh, every time she would talk to me, she, I had to work with her 16 hours a week and she's always covering up, covering up her mouth. And it, it was, it was the elephant in the room every week. And then she, 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 but she would mention to me how she was going to go to affordable dentures and get an upper denture. And I said, let's just, I said, get in a chair. We were, we were in, in, we were in the joint and I put her in a chair and I, and I looked at her case and it was really challenging. It was like multiple extractions, root canals, and it was going to be uh, 12 or 13 units uh, in the maxillary work. arch. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, two bridges and four crowns. And, uh, and then her lower arch wasn't as bad, but I just told her, I said, you know what, let's just, let me just do your case for free. Who cares? You know what I mean? Because, and then, but she had to travel two hours to come up here and, and get the work done. It took several visits and, uh, and I shouldn't have run my mouth because like I was expecting my brother to absorb the cost into his practice and he got all pissed off about it. And then like his wife got involved with it. And then like, they were like taking money out of my lowly paycheck for this case. And then my wife caught wind of it and then she was pissed off about it. And I'm like two grand deep in on this thing. And like my, and then like the, 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 the uh, staff in, in my office here, they're all weirded out about the whole thing. It was like, this, this case was going to cause me a divorce. And I thought to myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to pay like a couple grand more to finish this case off, you know? And I said, I'm probably going to get a divorce. I said, I'm going to call Keith. So I got to write him a letter. <laughs> and so I told my brother, I said, I'm writing Keith and I'm going to see if he can get me an Obama bailout, man, because <laughs> this is getting crazy, man. This yeah. case was stressing me out. And so I wrote you the letter, man. And then you said you'd do the case and I don't know what you did. I think you put your ace guy on it because it was sick. And man, when I go down there, she smiles and she, it changed her life, man. Oh, I and bet. <laughs> don't let your was... wife and other people see her now. Cause she's probably hotter than heck with those teeth. Now, oh, teeth that's what happened, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I, when I got a letter from you, man, and it kind of broke it all down, man, I was almost in tears. It just, it's, it's, you know, and you did, you get, went through a lot at your practice and everything else. Like you're just trying to do a good deed. You know, you're trying to help something well, out, and especially when you work with them all day. So I wasn't going to sit in there and not do anything about it when I had the capabilities of restoring the thing, uh, you know, and then, and then your guys knocked it out of the park, made me look good. It was ridiculous. Uh, I'm telling you. I can't wait to see some thing. pics, man. I want to see some pics of that. Well, I, I didn't take too many pics, man, because like, she's like embarrassed to even get the pics. And then I'm like, not Mr. Cosmetic guru. Here I am like taking pictures, like with my cell phone and junk. So it was just, now, nah, Hey, you know, it, all it, you need is one, shakes. all you need is one before and one after. And that's, that's all you need. And just, yeah, it's just, it is, you well, know. Yeah. I can, I can get, I can scratch together some and, and uh, do a halfway decent case presentation with it. But man, it, it was really neat. What kind of advice can you give some of these newer dentists starting out, you know, like do's and don'ts, anything, uh, you know, like starting off an associate, pretty smart going into your own practice. What kind of advice can you give out there? Some of our younger dentists that listen. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, if looking back uh, on my career, I literally have done it all from uh, associate to uh, prison dentistry to practice owner. Uh, my recommendation is first, I, I think you need to do a residency. Okay. That's what I think. I think that's critical. And then I think you need to get into practice, practice ownership as quickly as possible for financial reasons. Um, you know, the only time I made money in, in dentistry is when, you know, I owned a practice, but yeah. But, but that wasn't for me. So, I mean, but I'm fine. I don't, I don't need, you know, I didn't have a huge amount of student loans. I, you know, I had a little over a hundred thousand wiped that out a long time ago. I've been a dentist for 17 years now. So, but, uh, 
yeah, my recommendation is just buy a practice as quick as possible, quickly as you feel comfortable and uh, just digging in and take a no for an answer and, and uh, go for it. You know, that's treat, treat, you know, treat people as good as you can. I think one of the mistakes I did make early when I was a practice owner was I probably bit off a little more than I could chew. What I mean is probably should have referred a little more. I probably shouldn't have done that molar endo here and there yeah. thinking I was he man, you know? So it's like, no, you know, you can't, you can't solve the world's problems. You know, you just got to do what's best for the patient and, you know, and eventually um, you'll be as busy as you want to be and successful as you want to be. So this is the dental up podcast. Why did you get into dentistry? And at what point did you think I want to be a dentist? That's funny because I, I always wanted to be a doctor and okay. I was for sure I was going to be a physician, but everyone kept telling me, I think you would be a really good dentist because you just like teeth. And I, I absolutely did. I love looking at my own teeth. Whenever I would meet people, I would assess their teeth. But I thought, you know, that's really a cosmetic thing. I want to do something medical or clinical. And so I'm going to be a physician and I, after graduating from Stanford, I went to the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, and it was there that I learned that Native Americans have the highest rate of oral health disease in the country among all ethnicities, and that Native American children have the highest rate of dental caries. And that's when I realized that it's not just a cosmetic thing, that what's going on in your mouth is connected to your whole systemic health. And this is a excellent career, and there's not that many Native American dentists. In fact, there's less than 300 of us. And we have just the low, low, low rates of providers in our area. So I thought I can make a much bigger difference being a dentist than being a physician. And I'd still be a doctor. And also, I just love working with my hands. So um, making things, beadwork, painting, so sewing, it was a natural fit for me then. So November is National Native American Heritage Month. So it's a time when, um, you know, people, organizations are doing more to help educate the public and just really celebrating our culture. Um, so I think if people were interested, they can look into what was going on, especially at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of the American Indian. Even though it is a museum, it's, it's a living place where um, tribes still go and me and represent their culture. What did you do going to college? Where'd you go to college? Tell me a little bit about your journey there, if you could, doctor. I'm the first in my family to go and complete college. And I really just felt that um, I was strongly encouraged by my, by my parents, by my family, by my tribe. We're a matrilineal tribe. So women are always encouraged to do whatever they believe is possible. So I had no doubt that I could leave and be successful. But when I got there, it was different because it's hard to have any, there's not that many role models because there's not that many people who have made it through. There are some. Mm -hmm. And so it was challenging. The first year really was difficult. Um, I thought I was well prepared. I came from a public school and I had to learn a lot my freshman year of college to just catch up with all the chemistry and you know the calculus on top of all the reading for the humanities and the writing. Oh, so it was a challenge. But um, I stuck the course and I was really lucky that, that Stanford has a strong Stanford American Indian organization. So I had people there that I could turn to and they knew where I was coming from and they were also doing the same thing. So some of my classmates, they're doing fantastic things in their lives and their careers now. And after, after graduating from college, I wasn't quite ready to apply to medical school yet. I wanted to retake some courses and I was able to get a job at the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health in okay. Baltimore. And at that time, while I was working, I also did a master's in health science there at the School of Public Health. And that really helped solidify my science background so that I could be an excellent candidate for dental school. That's so cool. That's all. It's so tough to be a dentist. As I hear all these doctors that I talk to on podcasts just about their education and what they have to go through, it's it's quite the quite the challenge. I just don't know it's how. It's a journey. Yeah, yeah. It really is and tough. the dental school isn't easy. <laughs> no, I couldn't imagine. You know, I thought, oh, I'll be fine. You know, I, I went to Stanford and Johns Hopkins Dental School would be easy, but it's a different different environment and you know, the clinical skills are like nothing you've ever done before. And then I didn't come from a family of dentists, so I really wasn't sure what to expect, even though I, I had done some shadowing. But, it, you know, a lot of my classmates were very well prepared because they'd come from families of dentists and they'd known they wanted to be dentists since they were young. You are listening 
to the best of the Dental Up Podcast 2018. I did this podcast, man. I mean, I get nervous. I used to get nervous. I didn't want to do it. It's like, why am I doing this? Because I had this when Hornbrook was my clinical director, you know, and I'm like, let's do a podcast for the dentist. And so and then he left after a while. It's like, dude, what am I going to do? I'm not going to, who am I going to get another dentist in here? It's like, and I'm just thinking, let it go for a couple of months. And, you know, in my stomach, it's just like, oh, Sean, you got to do it yourself, you know, and it's just a matter of, you know, it's not like we're selling anything. It's not like we're sponsored and every 10 minutes telling you about, you know, buy this product and this and that. It's just basically about dentists, the real dentists that aren't lecturers and some might lecture, but it's just real dentists. And, you know, hey, I went to school here. I started my practice like this and it, it's turned out to be something that I'm not nervous anymore, but I just uh, I was out of my comfort zone doing this. And um, but yet now it's just something um I don't know. It's pretty neat. Just uh, talk to my existing accounts that work with me. And, you know, a lot of them don't want to do it. It's like, nah, Sean, I'm not going to do it. It's just audio. Just tell me about your story yeah. a little bit. But so I think everyone, you need to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. You can't just keep doing If you always do what you've always done, you'll always have what you've always had. <laughs> That's a great That's saying. Right. You just kind of got to push yourself a little bit. And, you know, it's like you did. You push yourself and heck, you got a hundred plus hours a year in education. You don't need to do that, you know, but uh, you keep pushing it and you to go to Koi's for years and years and years. And then now to be a mentor, you don't have to do that. You're doing that because it's in your heart and you're pushing yourself. And um, yeah. I think it comes back to you. I think, I think it comes podcasts back. like this are really good though, because I mean, a lot of these young dentists, they do have the debt and it's hard. I was talking to one last week and, um, she was saying, I, I so want to go up to Coist, or I so want to go up to Spear. And she asked how much it was, and we were talking, and she's like, I can't afford that. And I mean, she's making more than I was out of school, yeah. but the debt's so big for them. But things like these podcasts and the different groups on the internet and Facebook and wherever, it does at least give them an intro to a lot of stuff that lower cost you know because when i came out this there weren't podcasts that you could easily access on different topics and exactly groups that you could talk to so you know i'm a big fan of you know i, I used to go watch my surgeon work and my periodontist work i've driven i've picked mentor dentist and flown all over the country and watched them for a day or two in their office just to kind of get the ce but technology makes that a lot easier now than it used to be so i mean it's definitely something that gives us the advantages that we didn't used to have 15 20 years ago oh absolutely and you know when you say that right there i always had that in the back of my head that i've had some super you know great dentists that are just in great areas with just lots of patients and they got everything dialed in you know from the marketing to the staffing all the way till just their hand skills, you know, the, the dental part of it. And uh, I just would say to myself, dude, I mean, guy would do 10 grand a month, but you know what? We'd have to do like a grand a month to business over because of certain little things. And I always wished I could, cause I got doctors all over that are just crushing it and just really got it down. So, I mean, to send a Dr. Kiefer, send a Dr. Carlson, or to send a Dr. Kanka to go to these praxes, like, let me give you three or four grand a day or whatever it is. It's worth me five, 10 grand to send you out or whatever, just to work with. And a lot of times it's with ego. These dentists didn't want to do it because I've done it a few times with different dentists, but, um, and it's just the neatest thing in that, you know, swallow your ego. Let this guy come sit with your chair side for a couple of days going through your practice. And just to have an adjustment of this little bit will get you this and, and just change your life. And a little adjustments, not big, huge things. A little adjustment here, a little adjustment here. Use these burrs here when you're doing your depth cuts here. Use this cord when you're double packing the cord and use an emperor gum or whatever it might be. Or get this scanner from, you know, three shades man it's just send your impressions this way do your temps this way you know make your temps your contact circles bigger broader and keep your temps more in occlusion and you're not going to get eruption and it's just it's just a freaking neat thing when we can have a doctor kind of go do that for other guys 
that have it, but they just haven't fine tuned it. And I, I just think that's a that's a great thing. And I'm st- I'm going to put that back up on the top of the list too on my KOLs, my key opinion leader type dudes that are Keating's KOLs, Keating's key opinion leaders, and my guys. And it's not opinion leader; it's almost Keating, you know, freaking key hand. <laughs> key hands dentist or whatever i gotta come up with something but just the guys that got it down and practicing dentistry man just to go hey go to this practice here this dude will go from a you know ah, okay i'll shut up well, it all works better when we're on the same page you know <laughs> when the lab's on the same page the dentist is on the same page and the staff i mean it's yep. getting us all together i mean sometimes probably hurting cats but uh you know, communication, that's the key. You know? Oh, so absolutely. I'd say that's the biggest thing you've helped us with is, you know, it's it's never a blame game, you know. We can't get the shade or something doesn't mm-hmm. fit right. I mean, obviously, we want to know if the impression's off, you know, and you guys are great with that. But sometimes it's just hard. Yeah. you got a little <laughs> mouth. This person can't get it open. you got these retromolar pads or push it out in the back. Here. Yeah. It's so nice. And when we work together, you know, I mean, oh. we usually find a way to get it done. And Absolutely. so no, no blame, just getting on the same team and going forward. This is the Dental Up Podcast. So tell me, when you got out of college, did you start out as an associate or did you purchase a practice? Did you go and work at uh, your dad's practice? Tell me how that started you know, out. After, after my residency, I really, um, I really thought that I had no desire to own my own practice. Just the thought of that just terrified me. Um, but um, I, I ended up working for a large group practice in town for a very short while, um, and I and I and I was worked on commission, um, but I just I just found that um, Tay what did it was that the partners would do the crown and bridge, and then they would have me seat the crown and bridge and not get reimbursed for that, and oh. it just really ticked me off. Yeah. So I decided that was enough motivating for me to open my own practice because I'm like, man, I'm not going to get any better if I just am doing all the cleanup work and I'm not getting paid for this. I I just, I felt underappreciated. (laughs) Oh, I know. I can imagine. (laughs) But it was a good motivator to get over my fear of opening up my own practice. So, um, so that, that's why I, um, that's why I did it. But, um, you know, it's, and I'll tell you, there's, it's kind of, I, I mistakenly thought that the work was going to be getting ready to open the practice and then you just coast after that and that's definitely not true (laughs) that if you own a business it's just like i'm sure you own your business there's just a lot that goes into the day and day behind the scenes absolutely business-wise that you wouldn't have imagined you have to keep um nurturing yeah you Uh, know after you get it going the whole thing with dentistry and it's like in any business sure you know your um you know your field but then the front desk the back desk the books the taxes the payroll um the marketing the just the the everything is just there's a lot to it and i'm not saying it's a good thing but it never ends when you're a biz owner it's 24 no, it's 7. never <laughs> ending that's for sure you definitely need to, to be paying paying attention to things yeah. and, and hiring hiring the right people not necessarily the person with the most experience but the people with the right um just the uh, right attitude emotional and, IQ, and, and right exactly because exactly. you're going to be working yeah. with them you're with them all day every day more and than like, your family more right? than the family and so the exactly. whole thing with hiring people that's kind of an art to that and I've done pretty good on my hires and I've just been very blessed on everything that has worked out with us but you just got to let your ego go when it go comes to mm-hmm. running the business and just always I still do it I still bring in people um, to mentor me in certain areas mm-hmm. I bring in people to you know kind of break down what I'm doing to audit my processes and I'm right. always doing that. And it's just like, you have to do that. And it's just, and listening to your critics and your patients and or in my case, the doctors, like when there's an issue, take it to heart, you know, when you're the owner and sure. your name's on the building and you have to do that because the guys that don't right. do that or the girls that don't do that, you're not doing yourself any favors, you know, and you just right. put in your dues. Like you said, your first 10 years probably was the toughest and it's getting mm-hmm. easier for sure. I'm sure uh, for you, but 
some of these newer dentists, man, they just, they come in and they just expect the world. And now, man, you just got to get in those trenches, just work hard, do the right thing and just try to practice great dentistry and doing the right thing and taking care of your people. And it comes to you, it will come to you. And I think it's just, you know, it's just, it's so important. And I think that's it is that, you know, take, don't just, um, I think it's important to take pride and, all the things that you do, even the things that seem mundane, um, like a simple, sil- you know, amalgam filling, just do the best one you can do if that's what you're doing um, that day or on that person. Um, I think just overall taking pride in the finished product of what you're doing, then that carry. I think that helps you become better, you know, in, and, in, in all aspects. And it and it and the and your patients see it. They can see it with your staff and everything else that these guys care. They really want to do good. And then there's a certain doc, a certain people that don't really have that passion and people. People pick that up. A lot of, you know, it's like I have so many doctors when I go and ask them, so what do you do to drive patients to your practice? And a lot of them, well, I really don't do social media. I really don't do a bunch of anything when it comes to that. It's just, I just do the best job I can on my patients and we let them know that, hey, if you have friends that need some dentistry, let them know about us if you could, please. And they're like their biggest cheerleaders. And you got like what's raving fans. I have a book I read, Raving Fans. And, you know, if you concentrated more on your existing accounts that you have right now, you're mm-hmm. going to get bigger by just taking care of those guys in, instead of trying to bring in so many new patients. You just let the people do it for you. Treat them good and have your staff treat them good. And, you know, you'll grow your practice. Hey, and remember to go to KeatingDentalArts.com forward slash promo. Each month we have a new promotion, and man, you can save a lot of money on the different things. Sometimes it's on PFM, sometimes it's on Emacs, sometimes it's on our KDZ or our Keating Dental Zirconia. It could be our Bruxer or our Bruxer Aesthetic, but there are quite a bit of savings. So make sure you go to KeatingDentalArts.com forward slash promo, and you can see what we got offering for you guys. Again, thank you so much. We look forward to 2019 and helping you succeed in your dental practice. Say what you want about corporate dentistry. I've been super happy. I run my practice. I've never gotten a call from anybody telling me anything what to do. Yep. Um, I work my ass off. And then the difference is when I need something, I call and it happens. So, yeah. you know, I needed, I was ready. And, you know, I'm a profitable practice because that's the way I run my business. Yeah. And and my partner and I decide what to spend our money on. And, and we decide, you know, when we need a new employee and we decide, you know, that kind of stuff. But then I just call up and go, hey, I need a new employee. Yeah. They put an end to paper. They screen them for me. When we get screened, then they go to my office manager. I only see them when they come in for a working interview, and that's when I have to deal with them. You so know, it's that kind of stuff. And that's for a lot of dentists. It's not a, they would love it. I mean, because <laughs> a lot of guys don't have the structure and just their systems in place. Yeah. And that's kind of why you guys are rock and rolling. And it's not about yeah. – you know, so many dentists want to do every aspect, and they're only giving you know, 30 40% effort on each one where – be a hundred percent, you know, in your practice doing what you do and that's working on the patients and, and that yeah. and let everything else fall into place. And I remember back in the day, way back, one of the earlier meetings at dental time, remember we're outside and, uh, I remember work, Rick Workman was there. We just met him and there's yep. freaking somebody yep. blowing a doobie in the background and he's looking around. I remember going, Oh God, that's not me. I'm just the lab tech. But, uh, <laughs> he was so chilled about it. And, um, he, I remember at the time I was talking to him and he had 160 practices back then, and uh, I'm sure yep. that's a lot more yep. than they got now. But uh, it was just a uh, – he kind of yeah. reminded me of like a movie star type dude. He just had the good looks and just kind of remind you of like a – like a uh, McQueen. He does. Type I mean, guy. he's he's very charismatic, and he's yeah. he's he's there's there's over eight hundred and I think there's eight hundred and something oh, now. Eight hundred. Can you believe it, it was one hundred and sixty I mean, back insane. then? And I'm thinking, dude, yeah, yeah. I got a thousand doctors, a doctor, dental practices, but I'm thinking to myself, but I didn't say that to him because I was just kind of in awe. Yeah. Him. Like you said, he's kind of yeah. eccentric a little bit, but he just. He really, for me, just being a lowly lab tech, but I was with all the dentists. I was with you and Clayton and uh, yeah. and yeah. Scotty Bridges. And, you know, yeah. and we just kind of shut up and listened to this guy. And he's like the Pied Piper. And it was kind of a neat thing. But, uh, 
you know, some of the guys with their practices, oh, I don't want that. But uh, for some people, it works. And, uh, you know, they're not at 800 practices right now because of luck. Uh, they they made it happen. And it's right. helped a lot of right. dentists uh, practice what they want to do and, and let them do what they don't want to do. And it works, you know. Exactly. So hats off to you, exactly. man, on that, man. That, that's... Well, and when I, you know, when I join them, it, it, they have a ba- they really do. They have a bad rap, and it's from people that don't know. Yeah. It, really, you know, I mean, no, there's always people that are going to be unhappy happy yep. and they're going to leave because they're unhappy. But yep. the only way to be unhappy at a Heartland dental practice is to not do anything. Yeah. If you're going to, I didn't, I didn't have to change the way I practiced dentistry when I moved from private practice to that. Literally all I had to do was learn the names of the employees at the practice I joined because I, I presented the cases the same way. I, my communications were the same way. The things that I've changed are things that I've actually improved in terms of, you know, I used to have the financial discussions with the patient. I don't do that anymore. I have much more qualified people that can do that kind of stuff. I say, you know what? I don't even know how much a crown costs in my office. And I truly don't because there's 472 different insurance plans I take. So I said, I'm going to have you talk to the professional in my office that handles this all day. I'm just here to take care of the teeth and and to take care of you. And, and I, 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 move on. So, you know, it's a great, it's a great way. And and this is the way I practiced, you know, a lot of the stuff is the same way I practiced before. So it's not, it's not a shift in thinking in terms of how I practice dentistry. I'm still taking this, the same care of the same patients and 40% of my old practice has come with me because I had to leave it behind to get away from where I was. And 40% of my practice has found me and followed me because they like the way I did dentistry. And it's the same. It hasn't changed. Um, just the, the names of the players that, that I surround myself with have changed slightly. So um, it's not a bad gig. And um, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of really, really, really happy people that work for Heartland. I'll, oh, I'll tell you hey, that. I bet. There's, there's more happy than unhappy. <laughs> well, you just got to buy into it. And it's just, it, it works for people uh, that want to engage in, in having somebody run it. You know, doing the things they don't want to do, like the accounting and the billing, all that stuff. I mean, I, I think it's huge. Yeah, it, it, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do. I don't want to do the <laughs> IT. I want to call somebody when I need my IT fixed. Exactly. <laughs> He is. Yep. Yeah, yep. He is. That. He's uh he does a lot of clinical. I'm not actually sure how often I know he practices. It's not full time, okay. but I know he still does do some clinical, but he's like one of the senior. Um, I, I don't know all the titles yeah. in Harlan. Cause that's, I'm not like a big name person. I know, I know his name, but I don't know exactly what yeah. he does. It has to do with, he does a lot of the clinical supplies and the clinic, most of the clinical stuff. So supply testing and, and um, you know, cause we have preferred vendors and preferred supplies and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, so he does a lot of that kind of stuff. And no, um, he's, uh, he's the man. You know, I love the, Seth. The, he's he's a good guy. I always bust his balls yeah. like, dude, come on. now, Because, you, you know, you got at certain labs you can't use your pricing this and that. And I kind of always was, yeah. when I see him out at the conventions. Come on now, Seth. Because I used to do his work forever. But he kind of dropped down. And I think he's doing more for the corporation than actually practicing dentistry. I think but he is. I could see you, though, being one of the head mentors. Because you could do it all. You've been through it all. And just you're so strong in your personality. And and you just can get along with anybody. But I could see you, as it winds down, maybe I could see you really going out there and just really rocking and rolling with a lot I, of people. I would love that. I mean, I think that would be right up my alley because it would keep me in it. Yep. But also... It would just, you know, and I do, I do like to talk one-on-one to people, um, you know, to do that kind of thing and kind of pass it along. I can be a little, um, out there for some people. So I sometimes tend to bowl a really, really meek person. Maybe they wouldn't assign me to. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Cause I'd be like, what the fuck? You know, I mean, I would just be like, what is wrong with you? Yeah, pick, no, it up. So, pick it up, old timer. Gotta we got to get I gotta this to... in a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. This is a dental school, you moron. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. No, come on, put your big boy pants on and let's get this tooth yeah, isolated. Let's go. <laughs> Here, let me show you. Sit down in the chair and you know, monkey see, monkey do. Watch this. No, that's that's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> so, what is some of the advice you can give some of the newer dentists out there starting off? And I know you've seen it all from starting your own practice and everything yeah. else. What kind of advice for some of the newer young newer ones coming up and uh, with the do's and don'ts? 
you know, I, this is kind of funny because it's not this. My advice is not going to be clinical. My and I think I think 10 years ago, it would have been clinical, like get really good at root canals or get really good at extractions, which I mean, those are those are things, you know, d- don't go outside your comfort zone um, too far until you really get good at something. But the best way to do something is to just do it over and over. So, you know, say if somebody wants their tooth out, say, you know what? I've been trying to get better at endo. Let me, let me, let me get you a deal here for the cost of that extraction. I'm going to do a root canal on that tooth and um, I'm going to do it. And I just, you know, I want to get better at root canals and you know what, if it, if it's, if I do a good job, you know, not obviously presented a little bit differently than that, but you know, I want to get faster, whatever I want. I've got some new equipment. I want to try out whatever your spiel is. You know, I've got some new equipment. I want to get more efficient at, and since we're going to, we're going to take that tooth out anyway, obviously if it's a savable tooth, you know, let's, let me do the root canal so that I can get a little bit better with my equipment that I'm, that I'm testing or whatever your, your story is. And, um, and then, and then it's a win-win. I get to be, I get to be better. And you get you get a root canal for 175 bucks. Exactly. Um, you know those kinds of things. You cannot you cannot buy that kind of education. Yep. The patient knows they're going to be thrilled with a 175 dollar root canal, yeah. even if it takes them two and a half hours. You've now got another molar endo under your belt. Exactly. You know those kinds of things. You can't you can't be afraid to to think outside the box. But one of my biggest things that I would say is that you've got to develop yourself as the leader of the practice. Okay. It can't be. Um, you can't take your advice from your assistant. You can take information from your assistant, but you need to be the leader. And I'm not saying the dictator. You mm-hmm. need to lead lead by example. So you need to be not an hour late to work like I was this morning. You need to, um, you know, you need to be you need to be on time. You need to you need to 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 be true to your word. You need to um, treat all patients with honesty and integrity, and um, you need to treat all patients equally. You know, those are all things that I think people don't worry about and they think that stuff will kind of come along down the road but the the biggest thing you can be is is to be a leader to to yourself and to your family this works on kids too um you know i can't lie to somebody and then expect my kids to tell me the truth um you know it 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 works you know it works with staff it works with patients it works you know it works just in, in your personal life in general you'll just be a better person overall and if you can be a good leader um, the rest of it will kind of come along because your patients, your staff is going to love you. Yes. They are going to, your, your patients are going to love you because your staff loves you. Your kids are going to love you because you're not an a-hole all the time. Yep. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff that can come along with that, but just, I think, you know, doing that and thinking outside the box clinically, um, nobody comes out of dental school knowing how to do shit. Yeah, exactly. So just to say, um, you know what? I'm I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, I'm learning how to place implants. So for the next ten patients, which is exactly what I did, I placed implants before. I said, but my staff hasn't placed implants before. Yeah. I said, so there's going to be times when we we don't get it to the lab on time, or we write the wrong instructions, and it's going to take another week to get it back. Or you know, Dr. Bailey forgets to write down that it's a porcelain fused to metal screw retained crown, like I just did on my case to you. <laughs> I so um, I said, we're gonna, you know, now we're, we're 150 implants in. I may be just a moron, but no, um, you're doing great, you know, baby. By, by taking that time to, um, you know, explain to the patient, we are learning together. And my staff and I are learning together. They, the patients appreciate that. They appreciate the discount. We got to do um, 20 implants in our first month because I did them all for half price. Yeah, exactly. Um, and by, our, by the end of our first month, we were ready to go. I mean, like we knew um, we paid the first six months worth of our payments on the CT the CT and we were, you know, we paid for the implant kit and we were ready to go. So we were prepared. So then, you know, anytime a three unit bridge is on the, is on the menu, we, my staff feels comfortable offering an implant and talking to the patient about implants. Awesome. Um, the front desk knows how to explain financials because they did it 20 times in one month or yep. 30 times in one month to explain it. So, um, you kind of, you know, you just, you know, treat your practice as a, as a learning experience as well. This is the Dental Up Podcast. It's so rewarding to me, and I just love, for years, my my tagline was creating smiles every day, and we kind of do. We kind of work seven days a week here, man, and it's day and night because we have different crews that come in, you know, and um, we're just, uh, we're like a star football team here. It comes in, and we're working it, baby, and we're working it like three days, and it's, it's, it's out the door, and it's just, uh, it's what we do, and so it's something, um, 
I I just love the field that I'm in, and I just I've done a lot of smiles in my life, and uh, it it does change people's lives. And uh, it does. The, the, I recently received um, a case from your lab. It was six to eleven, and a bridge from eleven um, from twenty two to twenty seven. So just all the interiors. Okay. And it was for a dad that he wanted to be able to smile uh, at his daughter's wedding. So oh. and everybody loves him when he comes and everybody was happy to be able to see him smile. How did it go to so, place? It go to place like five minutes, you know, each, each crown, like they just drop into place. It, or it what? was beautiful because we, <laughs> we fixed uh, some misalignment that he had a number seven. So, um, and we didn't extract number seven. He, he had a second opinion that they wanted to extract number seven and, but we made it work and it looks great. That's so cool, dude. Sometimes on, on those on the sheet that we get, like for feedback, yep. I just say like thank you to the technician or you know who was in charge of that case or something. Well, they, they, all, they we, do a lot of work. So hey, what? <laughs> seeing that, I always ask, what kind of advice can you give some of our newer dentists just starting off? You're pretty new, but man, you got it together, man, because I've seen your work and you really are crushing it, dude. But what kind of advice can you get some of the younger guys that are starting off? You know, some of the do's and don'ts, or maybe starting off as an associateship, you know, um, or starting your own practice. What, what do you think? Uh, you can give me some advice on that for some of our newer people out there. I'll say, you know, what really helped me to to know, because once you graduate from dental school, you feel that you can do everything. Um, I, but I did go to an AGD and I think, you know, that really opened my eye to see how many things I didn't know and feeling comfortable with, you know, normal class twos or just the single crown. But then with um, more aesthetic cases, when you're worry about crown lengthening or the gingival heights or the buccal corridor or implants. Yep. Um, if you're that, if you have that type of personality where you like learning and you're not afraid of trying new things, I think like doing a good AGD, it's, is the way to go. Um, I mean, I went to Baylor and Baylor prepares you really, really well. You do a lot of procedures compared to other schools. And I felt really comfortable doing the, single tooth dentistry and i just didn't know what i didn't know you know what i mean exactly no that's um, a, that's so true so pursuing more education doing continued education because if you're not learning constantly learning new things then um you're just stuck in the same place and you don't know how much better you could be doing this is the dental up podcast there's a lot of guys that got great theory in their minds and got really smart, but they don't have a hand. Some guys got some hands, but they don't know what they're doing. You're the full package. And man, you're a very, very talented freaking dentist, dude. Cause I've seen you uh, firsthand. You're, you're, I appreciate that. It, you know, for me, it was, I think I got started on the right track. I had some good education uh, straight out of my residency and kind of connected with some good folks that uh, steered me in the right direction. But, you know, at the end of the day, to me, the and, and we can talk CAD CAM in general. I'm obviously a CIRAC guy and have been for all these years. But, you know, people, so someone actually came up to me at the Chicago Midwinter meeting and said, are, you know, are you, uh, are you, uh, do you regret calling your company CIRACDoctors.com and not something else because now CIRAC is not the only game in town? And I was like, no way, man. I mean, I'm no one is happier to see CAD CAM in general grow than me. I, I don't I I know Cirex's not the only game in town, and that's that's totally fine. That's, yep. there's nothing wrong with that. Just like you know, you can't be the only lab in town. Someone else exactly. can't have the only composite in town. There's plenty to go around for everyone. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just happy to see the segment grow. And you know, another thing, Sean, that I get a, a lot of is you know, oh, well, you know, you must not use your laboratory anymore. No, the labs are my partners. Yep. You know, you got to have a good relationship with your lab. Just because you're going to get a CAD CAM doesn't mean you're not working with your lab anymore. You're still doing a ton of cases with them. It's just the simple stuff that you can do at Chairside, do it. The more complicated stuff where you need the skill of your technician and the expertise of your laboratory partners, why wouldn't you use them? So it's, I, I, I'm just a, the, the, the glass is half full kind of guy and there's plenty of room for everyone to succeed. And it's not a me versus you or anything like that. I, I, it's, it's, and 
you know, I'm sure you see that too. We see that oh. too often in dentistry sometimes. It's, it's, it's disappointing. Oh, and you know, and I, the, what you said, it, it just resonates with me so much because everyone always said, oh, you, and I did. I kind of, at the beginning, I was I was a little bit threatened with Sarakin because it was just coming in gangbusters. And yeah. a, a lot of my dentists, man, is like, well, Sean, I, I got a Sarek now. And so I kind of lost the onesie twosies. But what I found out through the years, and I embrace them so much now because the Sarek guys and the other digital guys, they're some of my best dentists when I get their work because they see things so clearly and they practice at such a different level. And these guys are, I always say that, and I say my Sarah guys are some of my best dentists with the preps and everything else. And it's just something, um, yeah. you got to embrace it. And I kind of, I remember I did something with Mac Leaf several years back and I felt bad about it because I kind of said, well, Sarah kind of like an easy bake oven compared to my CAD CAM machines. And I didn't mean uh -huh. anything wrong by that I didn't but as I l think about it now I shouldn't have said that but it is amazing thing the way it's transformed the world of dentistry into I mean I always kid around like those little poke and plum towns where you poke your head out the window you're plumb out of town those are the guys with these Sarek machines that are just you're in a town they got to send it out they don't have local labs they got to send it out anyways but to do same day dentistry is an amazing amazing thing and especially yeah, for see, certain John, things guys like you are going to succeed in in the new order the new world of CAD CAM because you you've learned how to work with your with your clients in yeah. a in a very powerful way you whatever they need you bet you guys bend over backwards to help them exactly okay? the, you know exactly. we've done you know i remember man it was probably 10 12 years ago t-bone and i did a <laughs> uh, one of our hands-on workshops oh. the the live patient veneer course with you yeah. and you guys bent over backwards to to make sure that course went off without a hitch so people like you are going to succeed uh, because you uh, you embrace the change, you, you can't do anything about it, right? Yeah. You can't fight it. Yep, you it's gotta like roll with the change. Guys saying don't buy a don't buy a Model T. It's just it sucks. No, it doesn't. It, yeah. it, it is what it is. It's it's going to uh, it's going to be a part of every everybody's life. So exactly. the, the people that, that don't don't that fight it that yeah. that you know try to badmouth it, they're the ones that are going to get hurt. And it's just there's no point to it. Just yeah. it, it's the new world. Just learn how to live with it. Hey, just a reminder, if you could uh, go over to iTunes and search Dental Up and leave us a review, man, a little five-star review, man. We'd be really appreciative with that. And, uh, you know, leave us a review, leave some comments on it, tell us what you like if you could. And, um, you know, I really would appreciate that. Again, thanks again for listening to the Dental Up podcast. So tell me a little bit about, uh, did you start out as an associate or did you purchase practice? Tell me a little bit about how you started off when you first got out of dental school and everything. Okay, when I graduated the AEGD, I was fortunate enough to land in a practice. Okay. It was a bit of a commute for me. It was 45 minutes to an hour south of Los Angeles in traffic, okay. a place called Harbor City. And the practice had been there for many, many years, since about the 50s. And it was a larger practice where there were several specialists, okay. orthodontists, oral surgery, pediatric dentists and then a number of general dentists. So I was there as an associate for about 10 years. And it's just interesting how life takes you sometimes where you least expect it. Mm -hmm. Although I knew at seven, I wanted to be a dentist. I never knew or thought about having my own practice because it's really a separate and big responsibility yes. beyond the dentistry. So I loved working at Harbor Dental Associates because I really built up my speed, my skill. I kind of had, I had a lot of autonomy and I was really building my practice within the practice. You probably did get in, in the trenches, got so much different experience with all the different specialists. And I've had a lot of guys that kind of went that route where seven to 10 years plus and an in, in, in associate set up and, but it's the best thing in the world, setting them up for ownership on their own. I mean, instead of going in straight in out of school to own something, I, I think you did get a ton of probably great uh, practical experience for sure. Yeah, I loved it. Um, and then circumstance just put me in the position of eventually leaving there and starting my own practice. So you asked me if I purchased a practice. I did not. I took a big leap and started Duchesne Dental Arts five years ago. So yeah. 2013 um, with 
with not a patient to begin. You know, dentistry, especially cosmetic dentistry, really is a combination of science and art. It requires both skill sets. Yes. So I thought Duchesne Dental Arts really fits the description. So you like yeah. new veneers. What about endo? Are you doing endo or you not? Are you passing yeah, on? Yeah, so I am a big, I rely a bit heavily on my specialists. I really... Good. No, that's good. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of people in practice, they just want to keep the business in house and sure financially that's great, but I would rather focus in on what I love because then I do better at it and attract more of that and then count on my specialists to provide an equal amazing service uh, for the endodontics, for the root canals or for the oral surgery. Um, I'm not a one-stop shop. You know, I have my specialty, my area of focus, everything else I refer, um, refer out. You're listening to the best of the Dental Up Podcast 2018. For the newer dentists, I would say use an OptiGate and an Isodry. If I had that my whole career, I mean, it would have made life so much easier for me at work. So what is that for me? Is that Isodry? Yeah. It's like a... The OptiGate, OptiGate, O-P-T-R-A-G-A-T-E. That's the one that retracts the lips. Okay. Okay, I even use that like for surgeries, implant placements, just get the lips out of the way. Yep. And then the Isodry is the mouthpiece that has it's like a bite block with yes. a little shield. So it protects the tongue, the cheek, and the airway. And it's a bite block and it just keeps everything retracted. And then it also suctions at the same time. No kidding. That's kind of like the Isolite that uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Same Dr. Thing. Dr. Hirsch. Yeah, I had Tom Hirsch on a. Same thing. So you put the Isolite. Otrigate and the Isodry in, and you can work without an assistant if you didn't have an assistant. So, yeah, that is so neat. I would definitely like that, is like, oh, it's helps amazing. so much. Okay. And then find a mentor you can get advice from. Hang out with other dentists who are passionate about dentistry, not the ones who haven't taken a course in 10 years. Exactly. So, important to hang out with people who love dentistry. And, you know, you can find a mentor that'd be awesome or two mentors, treat patients like they're your family members and don't give in to pressure to produce for the sake of making the numbers. Try to do your best and don't give in to the pressure to practice sloppy or too fast. You're going to be slow at first, but that's okay. You're going to get faster. It just takes time and stay true to yourself and have gratitude each and every day and be humble yeah. Admit when you're wrong and work on your leadership skills because you're going to need to be a leader. Treat your team nicely because you need them. Yes. Get a coach if you can afford it. And I'm not talking about a tennis coach. I'm talking about like a life coach. <laughs> I have one. I talk to her every week. Oh, beautiful. Uh, she's awesome. And then you got to have fun at work. You got to have fun at home. Life is too short not to. Absolutely. So make time for fun. Thanks for joining us on the Dental Up Podcast Show this week. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or search the Dental Up Podcast on iTunes for our weekly feed. Don't forget to visit KeatingDentalArts.com slash promo for exclusive offers. Keating Dental Arts is a full-service dental laboratory, and we're nationwide. We'd love for you to send us a case so we can show you the Keating difference. If you dig what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes, and we'll be back next week.